Good morning, guys, or good afternoon, or good evening, good night, whatever it is. Um, today we're going to be doing a rapid review in psychology. So we're going to go over research methods. So I made this cool presentation. Um, disclaimer, a lot of the information is taken right from the IB textbook slash um, in thinking. So these are not my own cool divergent thoughts. They are basically straight from the IB, so I guess that's like the best way to study. So let's just jump into it. I have 15 minutes. You know how it goes. Okay, let's go. Okay, so let's talk about quantitative data first. So quantity, we're thinking numbers, like how, like quantity, that didn't really make any more sense, but quantitative data is looking at numbers and it's looking on, and the focus would be in behavioral manifestations. Um, the objectivity is, it's more objective and oftentimes the researcher is eliminated from the studied reality. And the methods of collection are experiment, quasi, 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 experiment and correlational studies. We'll get more about qualitative, qualitative and quantitative data, but let's go to qualitative data. So the focus is on human experience, interpretations and meanings, and the data collection would be texts. Um, the qualitative data tends to take a lot more time to analyze just because um, quantitative, you're just looking at numbers and you're establishing a correlation or whatever um, right then and there. But then for qualitative data, you have to go through all of the um, texts and all of the interviews and things like that. If you were to do an interview, you'd have to um, transcribe the entire thing and then analyze it. And then... So the objectivity is more subjective and the researcher is an integral part of the procedure and is considered a tool of measurement most times. Um, some methods of collection, we've got observation, we've got interview, focus groups, case study. Um, those are some of the popular ones, but we'll go into more of them. So some overarching concepts. So you've got sampling slash sample. So this is a group of individuals taking part in the research study. And then sampling is the process of recruiting these individuals for the participation so that you can take these findings and generalize them to a larger population. So if I was going to be doing a study um, on how Instagram affects teens, then I would be taking teens from different parts of this part of this country and this part of this country, and different age groups, different teens, so that I'm not just taking, um, I go to Laser Den, so if I was to be taking students from LJA and then basing the evidence that I find on the entire population, I'd have to take a stratified sample so that I can generalize these findings to a greater population. Um, credibility. Credibility is to which extent the results can be um, trusted to reflect the study. So how credible is their researcher bias, um, etc. We'll talk about that. Oh, bias. Okay. So bias, it characterizes the various distortions introduced to the findings by the researcher research procedure, mistakes in the process of measurement, unnatural behavior, and so on. I think I already touched on generalizability a little bit. I did not say that correctly, but whatever. It is the extent to which the studies can be applied beyond the sample and the setting and such. So, um, like I was saying, you have to use a stratified sample um, to get that generous... Oh, I can't say it. Okay, let's just move on to overarching concepts and research methods again. So, if you were to do sampling and experimental quantitative data... You'd be using random sampling, stratified, self-selected, or opportunity. These are all going to ensure, well, greater your chances of having um, a more generalized, um, your like your ability to take these findings and apply them to a larger population. If let's pretend instead of they're just random or stratified, like all around the places, and then opportunity is like, oh, I'm gonna post a thing up on a bulletin board and says. If you want to be in the study, just come at this time and do this. So, yeah. And then let's look at generalizable. I can't say this word. Oh, my gosh. Um, for experimental. So you've got to look at your external validity, the ecological validity, and the population validity. This is um, mostly for field. Um, actually, this could be used for both field and lab because you want to see, like, how the settings would impact the results and stuff like that. And then credibility, you have to look into the internal validity with these constant variables. And then bias, you want to look at those threats to internal validity. Okay. So for correlational, same. 
Um, general visibility, you have to look at the population and then the construct validity. And then credibility is just credibility. That's literally what it said. So, um, And then bias, you have to look at your method, method and measurement. And then qualitative research, you're going to look at quota, purposive, theoretical, snowball, slash convenience. These are all ways to um, have people be involved in your qualitative research. And then your general result. I cannot say this word. Oh my gosh. It's too early. It's 847. Okay. I'm not skipping class, by the way. I have a free period. Okay. And then sample to population, case to case, theoretical credibility, and then participant researcher bias. Let's go into variables. So variables, there is one independent. So independent variable is what you're changing. And then your DV is, um, and your dep dependent variable is what you're measuring. And then while other variables are controlled or there's extraneous variables. So, um, usually you have a control group. So if I was to, I'm just going to use the example of what I did for my IA. So I used the anchoring bias and then we had people have, um, we, have, we made a jelly bean jar and then we asked people, do you think that there are more than a hundred jelly beans? And then we would ask and then we'd gather the results. And then, um, and then we'd ask people, um, do you think, or like how many jelly beans do you think in this jar? That was our control group because we didn't give them an anchor. And then we would ask them, do you think how many do you think there are over a thousand jelly beans in this jar? And then they'd have to give their estimate. So that's an example of qualitative quantitative data because we were collecting numbers and we were collecting what the average person's guess was. And so we were able to um, see whether the anchor was affecting the results of um, result if our independent variable was the different anchor and then our dependent was um, the number given by the person. And so that's just an example of what independent variables and dependent variables are. And then sampling and quantitative research, we kind of went over that, but um, it's the target population, um, the group of findings, which we want to generalize. Okay, so the sample is the group of people that participate in the experiment and oftentimes needs to be diverse enough in order to represent the target population. We already talked about that. And then some types of sampling include random, snowball, stratified, convenience, and self-selected. So, okay, types of experience. So there's lab experiments, which are highly controlled, and usually um, there's an ability to um, control these extraneous variables that you might not be able to do in a field experiment because field, field experiments are usually more naturalistic, but um, some downsides of them is that they're very, very difficult to um to control extraneous variables, but also they're difficult to replicate. And um, but they do usually suggest findings that are more applicable to real world. So um, that's an advantage of that. But uh, okay, let's go quasi experiment. So participants in the quasi experiment are grouped based on a trait or behavior. So if I was to say um, Instagram makes people depressed then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take a bunch of people who are high, or who are been diagnosed as depressed and then I'm going to take a group of people that um, are not con clinically depressed and then I'm going to monitor their behavior and then just see whether or not um, there's a relationship between people depressed people just being on Instagram or if Instagram makes people depressed. So that's kind of what a quasi-experiment is. is taking out a group of people and then studying their behavior but then also a control. Um, let's look at natural experiments. So a natural experiment is... So a natural experiment and quasi-experiment are very similar because a natural experiment usually refers to an independent variable that is an environmental in nature, but an outside of the control of the researcher. So this natural experiment is basically like, okay, well, depression is a, like, a, it's a natural environmental thing that happens to people. Like, it's not just like, like, you don't, you don't like go out, so I don't even know how to say this, but like, it's like an, it's like a, a biological thing that happens to you. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, I'm going to like put, um, dopamine in you and you're going to become so happy. It's like one of those things is like, it's in your, I, I don't really have a good example for that, but I hope that makes sense that it's, um, a natural thing. Okay. Evaluating experiments and demand characteristics. So in an experiment, researchers attempt to control as many variables as possible, but sometimes extraneous variables influence the data. We already talked about that. But um, demand characteristics occur when participants act differently simply because they know they're in the study. So if I was in a study and they, I kind of figured it out that they were looking for um, how, like, how, how, if they were asking me, for an example, like, in, um, 
what's the one, the prison, ex the Zimbardo prison experiment, they're asking me, like, oh, like, you're gonna be a prison, you're gonna be the guard, well then, if I'm no, if I know that they're testing whether or not I'm, like, being violent towards these prisoners, then, like, you know what, I might wanna, um, I want, I might do the social desirability effect, and I'm going to try to make myself look good to the researcher rather than look like this evil tormentor and stuff like that, so, um, that's an example of both those two, and then the screw you effect is the participant attempts to discern the experiment's hypothesis, but only, um, so I'm basically like, I'm like, ha, I don't want to be in this study, I'm gonna totally mess it up, I'm gonna screw you, I'm gonna just, like, mess around and stuff like that, so that's the screw you effect, and then expectancy effect is when the, um, participants attempt to discern the hypothesis with goal of helping the researcher, um, this may impact, this may be, like, me, me trying to, I'm um, getting that Zimbardo be like, oh, well, they want to see that prison guards get, um, violent when they have this authority position, so I'm actually just gonna act really violent, even though in my everyday life, I'm, I, and even in this situation, I'm not gonna do that, but because I want to help the researcher, I'm gonna go crazy and beat these prisoners with a stick. Okay, that was a little bit harsh, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, um, ex evaluating experiments part two, so there's a researcher bias when the experimenter sees what he or she is looking for, so to do this, you might want to use a double-blind control, which, um, both the researcher, the researcher doesn't know who's been affected by this, and the participants doesn't know who's been affected by the other thing. Like, they don't know what group they're in and stuff, so there is, that's how to avoid researcher bias. And then participant validity is the limitation of a study when characteristics of the sample affect the dependent variable. And then bidirectional ambiguity, ambiguity is seen in correlational research because since no independent variable is manipulated, it is impossible to know if X causes Y, Y causes X, interact to cause behavior, or it's just coincidental that the results are actually due to a third variable. So, um, do I have a good example for that? Um, I'm like, let's do, hmm, cucumbers make you, if you eat cucumbers, you'll have a six pack. Um, all these people are eating cucumbers, I see like, oh, all of these people how, that are eating cucumbers for like five days or whatever are getting six packs. That just, that must mean that cucumbers give you six packs. What I didn't know is that in this, there's actually people who are going to the gym and doing like 30 hours of like ab workouts every single day. So I'm, this is just an extraneous variable that is making it seem that there's a correlation, but actually in reality, people are going to the gym and just like going ham and doing a bunch of push-ups and sit-ups and stuff. So that's kind of an example of bidirectional ambiguity. I'm sorry, my things kind of suck. Okay, interviews. Let's talk about this. So this is a qualitative research method, by the way. So structured interview, um, the instruct, the, basically, I'm asking you the same questions and I'm expecting different answers and I'm writing them down. An unstructured in interview, the interview schedule, only specific like, it just, I'm like, so, how's your day? We're just talking. I'm just trying to get, get as much information as I can about you. Um, there really is no script or anything. This can be a little bit difficult to replicate. Actually, it's, like, impossible to replicate because conversations are very different from participant to participant. And then semi-structured interview. So it involves a set of open-ended questions that are up to interpretation, and the respondent is asked is able to respond more freely, maintaining the focus of the interview. And interviewers also may ask additional questions in order to gain um, to gain trust or gauge more understanding and such. Um, so I think that semi-structured interviews are actually the best when you're trying to um, get real answers out of participants because um, structured interviews are a little bit seen as more. Um, rigid and things like that, but semi-structured, you're, there's a little bit of leeway in that, but you get the same results most of the time. And then focus groups are good because, um, if you were talking about, like, an, a, they're good and bad, um, obviously with everything, but, um, with focus groups, a lot of times people, they are, there's, like, a, there's, like, a freedom to speaking to a group instead of just one-on-one -on -one with a partic with a researcher, but there's also, um, conformity effects, so people may not, um, tell the whole truth or may, um, may say something different so that they are perceived better in the group, um, that would go to Ash and how the Ash paradigm people are 
people conform. We'll talk about that later. Okay, and then this is my last slide. So observations, there's naturalistic observation, and then there is a researcher can choose to carry out a participant observation where he or she is part of the group being observed, so or non-participant observation where he or she is not part of the group, and then both people can often change their behavior due to reactivity, and then obviously there's case studies and surveys, which are other forms of qualitative research. So guys, um, I have like 20 seconds left, so... Thank you so much for watching my research methods video. I hope this helps you. Um, I have my quiz today. Hopefully I don't fail. Yay. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a lovely week. Um, comment down below any videos you want me to make. Okay, bye.